Welcome. It's good to see you here. I want to invite you to bow your heads with me as we ask the Lord's presence with us today. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being here. We ask for divine wisdom to understand your word. We're living in very, very turbulent times. We want to know what your will is, and we want to abide in that will. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, what we want to do first is review the two topics that we studied in our last presentations. The first presentation was on the historical method of studying Bible prophecy. And you'll remember that we noticed that the historical method begins in the days when the prophet wrote and ends with the setting up of Christ's everlasting kingdom. And basically, we took Daniel 7 as our model for the historical method. And I want to review the sequence of events in Daniel 7 as well as in Revelation chapter 13 because it's important that we remember the sequence, the links in the chain, if you please. We have, first of all, in Daniel chapter 7, which kingdom? Babylon, very well. Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. What is the next kingdom after that? Medo-Persia, very well. Then afterwards we have a third kingdom, which is Greece. And then we have a fourth kingdom, which is the Roman Empire. And then what happens to that fourth beast? Oh, it sprouts what? It sprouts ten horns, that's right. In other words, the Roman Empire is divided. And then among the ten rises a little horn. And the little horn rules for how long? 1,260 days, but days in prophecy are equivalent to what? Are equivalent to years. And of course, what power is represented by the little horn? It represents the Roman Catholic papacy. Not the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic papacy, which is a system that unites church with the state. And then we went to Revelation chapter 13. And we notice that Revelation 13 provides links in the chain that Daniel 7 doesn't. Do you remember that the beast in Revelation 13, the first beast that rises from the sea, represents the same thing as the little horn? Because it rules 42 months. And 42 months times 30 days each month is 1,260. The same number of years that we found that the little horn ruled. And so basically, Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 10, tells us that the beast, which is the same as the little horn, ruled for 1,260 years. But at the end of the 1,260 years, what happened to the beast? It received what? It received a deadly wound. What weapon gave the beast the deadly wound? It was the sword. And who bears the sword? The civil power, the state, is the power that bears the sword. Was the papacy wounded by the civil power? Yes. France withdrew its support from the papacy. In other words, it took away the sword from the papacy, and with the sword, it gave the papacy a deadly wound. Of course, the sword is symbolic. So we're told that the papacy received the wound with the sword, the civil powers withdrew their support from the papacy, but then we notice in Revelation chapter 13 that something is going to happen to that deadly wound. What's going to happen to the deadly wound? The deadly wound is going to be healed, and all of the world is going to wonder after the beast or the little horn. You see, Daniel 7 doesn't explicitly tell us that the little horn is going to have another period because Daniel chapter 7 simply speaks of the dominion of 1260 years of the little horn. But Revelation chapter 13 adds that at the end of the 1260 years, it was going to receive a deadly wound and then its deadly wound would be healed. Now, which is the power that heals the deadly wound according to the book of Revelation? That's right, the United States. Another beast that rises from where? From the earth. It has two horns like a lamb, 
Uh, these two horns represent civil and religious liberty, the separation of church and state. The fancy terms are republicanism and Protestantism. And so for a while, the United States behaves very well. It abides by these two principles, but then eventually it ends up speaking like what? It ends up speaking like a dragon. And we notice in our study, in our, in our first study of this series, that this beast that rises from the earth, actually everything it does is to help the first beast recover its power. It exercises all the authority of the first beast. It commands everyone to worship the first beast. It does everything in the presence or in beha on behalf of the first beast. It builds an image of the first beast and it imposes on pain of death the mark of the first beast. You see, everything this second beast does is to help the first beast recover its power. Has the deadly wound yet been healed? No. When the wound is healed, the papacy will behave in the future like it did in the past. And that will lead to the greatest time of trouble in the history of the world. The great tribulation that Jesus spoke about in Matthew chapter 24. And the tribulation will be cut short by the second coming of Jesus Christ to establish his kingdom. So you see Daniel chapter 7 and Revelation 13 take us from Babylon, which is the kingdom that existed in Daniel's day, it takes us all throughout the course of history, link after link, culminating with the setting up of Christ's everlasting kingdom. Isn't this a nice method of interpreting prophecy? It's discipline. In other words, it's not guesswork. You don't have to guess who the little horn represents. All you have to do is know where the series starts, follow the sequence, and then when you get to the little horn, you know what the little horn represents. Now, in our second study, the last time, we also noticed that the little horn would do something during the 1260 years. Two things. First of all, it would think that it could change what? God's law. Has the Roman Catholic papacy claimed to change God's law? Absolutely. Even though the second commandment that says don't make uh, images and don't bow down to the images, the Roman Catholic Bibles have that commandment, the catechisms don't. And the catechisms are used for instructing Roman Catholics, children, to prepare them for First Communion or for Confirmation. And so, uh, you know, the Roman Catholic Church doesn't encourage people to read the Ten Commandments in the Bible. They say the interpretation of the church in the catechism is the true interpretation of the matter. Another way in which the papacy sought to change God's law was establishing a counterfeit day of worship. The Bible says that we're supposed to keep the seventh day Sabbath, but the papacy says, no, we are supposed to keep what? Sunday. And they say the church, the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy changed the day from Sabbath to Sunday. But we also notice that the little horn not only would think it could change God's law, but the little horn also thought it could change God's what? God's times. Do you remember that we studied the times? What does the word times mean? What does Daniel 7 mean when it says that the little horn would think to change God's times? Well, you received a handout this evening with these two words. One is Hebrew and the other, well, actually some are Hebrew and some are Aramaic. Uh, the word Idan and the word Seman. I hope that you'll take this home and look up all of these verses and you will see that Idan and Seman are pretty much synonymous. When the Bible says that God changes the times and the seasons, and the Apostle Paul says about the times and the seasons, I don't need to tell you because we've already studied prophecy. When Jesus said to the disciples, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons, basically what it means is that God is in control of the flow of world history. He reveals how events are going to take place. Did Nebuchadnezzar try to change God's scenario? Yes. Did King Darius in chapter 6 also try to change God's scenario? Absolutely. But who controls the times? God. And who commanded to keep his law? God. So what the Roman Catholic papacy did 
uh, was first of all say that you're supposed to keep Sunday as a day of rest, changing God's law, but it also, we're going to notice, claimed to change the sequence of prophetic events. And in the next several presentations, we are going to study how the papacy attempted to change God's prophetic calendar, how the events in the chain of prophecy were going to be fulfilled. Now, when we think of the Protestant Reformation, expressions such as sola scriptura, scripture alone, sola fide, faith alone, sola gratia, grace alone, come to mind. But really, these solas, as I call them, were a reaction of the reformers to the Roman Catholic papacy. They had come to believe that the Roman Catholic papacy was the Antichrist. And I'm going to read several statements from the reformers this evening, a little bit later on, to show you what they believed about the Antichrist. They believed that the papacy was the Antichrist of Scripture. How did they know that? Well, the reformers used the historical method, the historical flow method. They knew that Babylon had passed. They knew that Medo-Persia had passed. They knew that Greece had passed. They knew that the Roman Empire had passed. They knew that the Roman Empire had been divided into ten kingdoms. So they said the Roman Empire was divided in ten kingdoms in the fourth and fifth centuries, so it must be that the little horn appeared shortly thereafter. And so they looked, they said, where would the little horn be? They say, it's the Roman Catholic papacy. So in other words, they lived during the flow of Bible prophecy, they lived at the time when the little horn was ruling. And so it wasn't difficult for them to identify the fact that the little horn represented the Roman Catholic papacy. You see, they could see the chronology, and they also could see the activities of the little horn, of the papacy. So they said, hey, it comes right at the time in the line of prophecy where it was, it was supposed to come, and its activities of speaking blasphemies against the Most High and persecuting the saints of the Most High, etc., is what's taking place. And so all they had to do was use the historical method, the historicist method, and see where the papacy fit within the sequence. And this understanding of Bible prophecy gave the reformers a mandate to unmask the Roman Catholic papacy as the Antichrist of Scripture. Let's examine some of the writings of the prominent reformers of Protestantism. I've taken a lot of these statements from a work that was written by Leroy Edwin Froome. It's called The Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers. It has four volumes. Basically, Elder Froome, who was the ministerial director for the General Conference for several decades, he went to Europe, he spoke several languages, and he traveled for several years going through the libraries in Europe, accumulating information on how prophecy was interpreted from apostolic times all the way till the middle of the 20th century. You know, those books, unfortunately, are out of print, but they are a masterpiece. In fact, not only in the Adventist church, but in the secular world, uh, in, in uh, the other churches, there were several scholars that said, wow, this is a tremendous series on Bible prophecy. And so I'm going to take these statements from his, uh, volume two of the prophetic faith of our fathers, but of course Froome takes them from the original sources. Let's begin by uh, noticing, before we read these statements, let's begin by noticing the summary of what the Protestants believed about Bible prophecy. What method did they use? I'm going to give you a list of non-negotiables for the Protestant reformers. Number one, they used the historical flow method or historicism. That's how they knew that the papacy was the link in the chain at the time when they lived. Secondly, they did not believe that the Antichrist was a single individual. They believed that the Antichrist was a system composed of a succession of popes who taken together are the Antichrist of Scripture. 
They also believed that the Antichrist actually would sit in the church. He would claim to be the vicar or the representative of Christ. They didn't believe that the Antichrist was going to be a blasphemous individual that would arise and blaspheme the true God. They believed that the Antichrist would be an, a, a series of individuals that would rise within the church and corrupt the church from inside. They also believed that the fourth beast of Daniel 7 was the Roman Empire. And they believed that the ten horns that came forth from the head of the fourth beast represented the divisions of Western Europe, the nations of Western Europe. They also believed that the restrainer that is mentioned in 2 Thessalonians 2, it speaks that we're going to have two uh, presentations just on 2 Thessalonians 2, but they believed that the restrainer that was restraining the man of sin from manifesting himself was the existence of the Roman Empire. As long as the emperor was ruling, they said, the man of sin, the Antichrist, cannot surface. But as soon as the, the power that withholds or withstands, as soon as the Roman Empire, uh, the Roman Emperor is removed, then the Antichrist will appear. So they believe that the restrainer of 2 Thessalonians 2 was the Roman Empire. And when the Roman Empire would be taken away, the restraint would be taken away, and the man of sin, the papacy, would manifest itself. They also believed that the temple in which Antichrist would sit, because 2 Thessalonians 2 says that the Antichrist would sit in the temple of God. The reformers believed that the temple of God was not a temple of the Jews built in the Middle East, but the temple was actually the Christian church. And when you read in the writings of the Apostle Paul, every time he uses the word naos, the word temple, he's referring to a spiritual temple. He's referring to the church. He never uses the word naos to refer to the temple of the Jews. They also believed that the harlot of Revelation 17 was a Roman Catholic papacy. They also believed that the abomination of desolation of Matthew chapter 24 represented the papacy. And of course, they believed that the man of sin was the papacy. And one of the reformers, at least, believed that the king of the north in Daniel 11 represents the papacy. That's very interesting. The reformers also believed that the Israel of their day was the church. They did not believe that literal Israel were the people of God. They believed that the people of God were those who accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. They believed, in other words, that Israel was spiritual Israel. It was the church. And finally, they believed that the time periods in which the little horn and the beast would rule were to be understood symbolically and not literally. I want you to remember all these details because we're going to find that the Roman Catholic papacy changed every single one of these things that the reformers believed. If Martin Luther resurrected today, he would die of a heart attack when he saw, when he would see what has been done to the Reformation that he spearheaded. Now let's take a look, look at some of the reformers and what they wrote about the Antichrist. They were unanimous that the Antichrist was the Roman Catholic papacy. Let's begin with John Wycliffe. He lived from 1324 to 1384 A.D., he wrote a book titled De Papa, which means about the Pope. In chapter 2 of his book, he wrote, The Pope is Antichrist here on earth. Now, during the period that Wycliffe lived, there were two popes that were competing for the papal throne. They both claimed to be the true pope. And this is what uh, Wycliffe had to say about them. He said, they are two halves of Antichrist making up the perfect man of sin between them. <laughs> now, he also wrote the following on Daniel 7, 25. I want you to notice his interpretation of Daniel 7, verse 25. He wrote, Why is it necessary in unbelief to look for another Antichrist? He says, why should we be looking for another Antichrist? In the, 17th in the seventh chapter of Daniel, Antichrist 
is forcefully described by a horn arising in the time of the fourth kingdom. Are you with me? Whom did Wycliffe believe the little horn was? The papacy. That's right. And by the way, he lived before Luther. He lived perhaps a hundred and he was born a hundred and fifty years before Luther. Now, notice what he continues writing, writing. Therefore, the ten horns are the whole of our temporal rulers. What he's saying is the ten horns are the temporal rulers in Europe now. And the horn has arisen from the ten horns, having eyes and a mouth, speaking great things against the lofty one, and wearing out the saints of the Most High, and thinking that he is able to change times and laws. Did he have the, the interpretation of Daniel 7.25 pretty clear? He most certainly crystal clear. He understood that the fourth kingdom is Roman Empire. He understood that the ten horns were the nations of Europe in his time. And he understood that the little horn was the Antichrist and represented the Roman Catholic papacy. Now let's talk about William Tyndale. Perhaps you haven't heard about some of these individuals, but they were very influential in the Protestant Reformation. Tyndale studied at Oxford and Cambridge in Europe. He was the first to translate the New Testament into English. In the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic papacy despised him for translating the Bible into English. He was burned at the stake, in fact, for translating the Bible into the language that people could understand. He wrote the following about the Antichrist. The Pope's forbidding matrimony and to eat of meats created of God for man's use, which is devilish doctrine by Paul's prophecy, are tokens good enough that he is the right Antichrist and his doctrine sprung of the devil. What do you think? Was he crystal clear? How did he know this? Because he was living in the period of the little horn. You see, the reformers, they could see the historical flow of prophecy. They knew that Babylon had ruled, Medo-Persia had ruled, they knew that Greece had ruled, they knew that Rome had ruled, they knew that Rome had been divided into ten kingdoms, and they said, of course, if Rome was divided in ten kingdoms in the fourth and fifth centuries, then, and the little horn rises among them, then we must be living in the period of the little horn. I mean, it's not rocket science, folks. It's very simple when you study the prophetic chain, when you use the historicist method or the historical method. Martin Luther, the founder of the Lutheran Church, the, he's famous because he nailed the 95 Theses on the cathedral door in Wittenberg on October 31st, 1517. And by the, by the way, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, a year before this, uh, actually it was uh, in the year uh, 2017, the Pope and the Lutherans got together in Malmo in, in Sweden to begin a year's celebration of the Protestant Reformation. Do you think Luther would have ever done that? Not in your lifetime would Luther have done something like that. Now notice what Luther had to say about the Antichrist. This uh, uh, is once again found in the resource that uh, was prepared by Leroy Edwin Prune. I quote, I am practically cornered and can hardly doubt anymore that the Pope is really the Antichrist, whom the world expects according to a general belief. And now notice why he believes that the, believed that the papacy was the Antichrist. He says, because everything so exactly corresponds to the way of his life, action, words, and commandments. Was he just guessing? He says, well, you know, the Pope, he's a nasty guy, so he's the Antichrist. That's the way Protestants these days try to interpret Antichrist. They say, oh, well, let's see, who could Antichrist be? Well, maybe Hitler, because he's a nasty guy. Maybe Saddam Hussein. 
Maybe it was the Ayatollah Khomeini. You know, it's guesswork because Protestantism, as we're going to see, has lost the method, the proper method of studying Bible prophecy. Martin Luther also wrote in the year 1540 the following. It's actually kind of like a prayer. O Christ, my Lord, look down upon us and bring upon us thy day of judgment and destroy the brood of Satan in Rome. You know, this is pretty strong stuff. You say, maybe he should have been nicer. Well, maybe Jesus should have been nicer when he called the apostate Jewish leaders in his day brood of vipers and serpents and said, how will you escape the condemnation of hell? No political correctness there. You know, sometimes we have to tell the truth and it's understandable that it might hurt, but in the long run, a little hurt is better than being lost at the end of the age. So he continues writing the following. There, he's speaking about Rome, there sits the man in Rome of whom the Apostle Paul wrote, and then he puts in parentheses 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4, where it speaks about the man of sin. So he says, there sits the man of whom the Apostle Paul wrote, that he will oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God, that man of sin, that son of perdition. What else is the papal power but sin and corruption? Are you catching the picture? Now, one of the very close collaborators of Martin Luther, actually uh, his right-hand man, if you please, was Philip Melanchthon. You know, God has a tendency to unite individuals of two different types of personalities. <laughs> you know, like for example, Paul and Barnabas. Do you know what kind of man Paul was? He was an explosive person. You know, when John Mark, uh, you know, he got discouraged and didn't want to go, the apostle Paul got mad. He said, get rid of him. And there was a fight between him and Barnabas. And Paul went his way and Barnabas went his way. Paul could be very abrasive. But, but God called Barnabas to kind of tame him a little bit. So Martin Luther was that kind of person. He was kind of like, uh, like the Apostle Paul, you know, very zealous for the truth. And Melanchthon would say, well, let's speak the truth, but, you know, let's, let's be a, a little bit uh, softer. Now, notice what Philip Melanchthon had to say. By the way, he was born in 1497, and he died in 1560. This is what he wrote in a document called The Disputation on Marriage. It has a series of propositions. I'm going to read number 18 uh, through number 25. Actually, number 26. This is what he wrote. Since it is certain that the pontiffs and the monks have forbidden marriage, it is most manifest and true without any doubt that the Roman pontiff, now here's a very important point, that the Roman pontiff with his whole order and kingdom is very antichrist. Did Luther believe that an individual pope was the antichrist? No. Notice, once again, he states that the Roman pontiff with his whole order and kingdom, the antichrist is not an individual, it's a kingdom, is very antichrist. That's Proposition 18. In Proposition 19, he states, likewise, in 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul clearly says that the man of sin will rule in the church. So the temple is what? The church. See, all the points that I mentioned, all the summary of Protestant beliefs. Likewise, in 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul clearly says that the man of sin will rule in the church, exalting himself above the worship of God, etc. Proposition number 20. But it is certain that the popes do rule in the church. Notice the popes, plural. The Antichrist is not an individual. It is a succession of popes that lead a kingdom, the kingdom of the papacy. So therefore, he says, um, once again, but it is certain that the popes do rule in the church and under the title of the, of the church in defending idols. Therefore, I affirm that no heresy hath arisen, nor indeed shall be, with which these descriptions of Paul 
can more truly and certainly accord and agree than with this pontifical kingdom. Notice, he's not saying an individual is antichrist. It's the whole pontifical kingdom. It is the papacy in all of its history. In Proposition 25, and this is very interesting, he's actually going to say that the king of the north of Daniel 11 is the papacy. Now, that's very, that's very interesting because there's a lot of debate these days about the king of the north. Some people say, even in the Adventist church, that the king of the north is Turkey. But, but Melanchthon was clear on the identity of the king of the north. Let me just read here proposition number 25. The prophet Daniel also attributes these two things to Antichrist, namely that he shall place an idol in the temple and worship it with gold and silver, and he shall not honor women. That is in Daniel 11, folks. And then Proposition 26, he says that both of them, both of these, gold and silver and not honoring women, that both of them belong to the Roman pontiff. Who does not clearly see? The idols are clearly the impious masses, the worship of the saints. And the statue, statues which are exhibited in gold and silver, that they may be worshipped. So the king of the north was also believed to be the papacy. By the way, when you read all of the statements of the reformers, you discover that, that they understood that in the Bible the papacy is referred to in different ways. The papacy is the little horn. The papacy is the beast. The papacy is the Antichrist. The papacy is the harlot. The papacy is the man of sin. All of these different re references refer to the same power. Now let's talk about John Calvin, the founder of the Presbyterian Church. He lived from 1509 to 1564. I read just one statement from John Calvin. Some persons think us too severe and censorious when we call the Roman pontiff Antichrist. So even some people were saying, hey, don't, don't do that. Don't be politically incorrect and say the papacy is the Antichrist. Don't be mean-spirited. It was happening back then. He continues, however, those who are of this opinion do not consider that they bring the same charge of presumption against Paul himself, after whom we speak and whose language we adopt. I shall briefly show that Paul's words in 2 Thessalonians 2 are not capable, now listen to this, Paul's words in 2 Thessalonians 2, we're going to have two presentations on 2 Thessalonians 2 later on in this series, are not capable of any other interpretation. He says, this chapter is not open to any other interpretation than that which applies them to the papacy. You know what's interesting is none of these Protestant churches these days believe any of this. They've totally gone astray, we're going to see, from the prophetic roots. They've adopted the two systems that the papacy established. In this way, they have changed God's times, God's prophetic times. It's going to be an exciting uh, story that we're going to study here. By the way, I wrote a book called Futurism's Incredible Journey, where there are many, many other statements and much more material than what I'm presenting here. Uh, you can uh, get this book from Secrets Unsealed. Uh, everything is documented with footnotes, etc. Now, let's talk about Ulrich Swingli. He is the founder of the Reformed Church. Notice what he wrote. He, he was a little more diplomatic, a little nicer, but he didn't fail to identify the papacy as the Antichrist. This is what he wrote. I know that in the papacy works the might and power of the devil. <laughs> that is, of the Antichrist. Once again, I know that in the papacy works the might and power of the devil, that is, of the Antichrist. And then he says, yet I cannot approve of the Anabaptists proclaiming the word of God 
only because of their hatred against the Pope, because the Anabaptists hated the Pope, and so their, all of their emphasis was on, was on Pope hating the Pope. He says, you know, that can't be your only topic. He continued writing, I desire much more that the love of God would be their motive in resisting Antichrist and to lessen the burdens of their neighbors. So Swingley, even though he's a little more diplomatic, very clearly says that Antichrist is the papacy and needs to be resisted. Now let me give you a quotation from John Knox. He lived from 1505 to 1572 A.D. He was the great champion of the Reformation in Scotland. And um, I want you to notice what he wrote. Once again, he's going to tell us that the papacy is not an individual that is going to rise in the Middle East after the rapture, who's going to sit in a rebuilt Jewish temple for three and a half literal years, like conservative Protestants are teaching today. No, no, no. Notice what he wrote. First then, not only are all the impious traditions and ceremonies of the papists taken away, that is, he's saying that we're taking them away from Scotland, but also that tyranny which the Pope himself has for so many ages exercised over the church. Now let me ask you, did one Pope exercise power in the church over all of the ages? One individual Pope? Of course not. I read it again. He's speaking of a succession of Popes as the Antichrist. Let me read it again. First then, not only are all the impious traditions and ceremonies of the papists taken away in Scotland, but also that tyranny which the Pope himself has for so many ages exercised over the church. It is altogether abolished, that is in Scotland, and it is provided that all persons shall in the future acknowledge him to be the very Antichrist and son of perdition of whom Paul speaks. The mass is abolished. He's speaking about what is happening in Scotland. The mass is abolished as being an accursed abomination and a diabolical profanation of the Lord's Supper. And it is forbidden to all persons in the whole kingdom of Scotland either to celebrate it or to hear it. What about John Wesley, the founder of Methodism? These are all the founders of the great Protestant churches, the mainline churches today. What did John Wesley have to say? He wrote, he is in an emphatical, an emphatical sense the man of sin. As he increases all manner of sin above measure. And he is too properly styled the son of perdition as he has caused the death of numberless multitudes both of his opposers and followers. Did John Wesley believe that the papacy was the Antichrist? Absolutely. All of the great reformers, without exception, believed that the papacy was the Antichrist. Not the Catholic Church, the papacy. They could see it. Because they looked at the sequence of powers, and they looked at the activities and the attitude of the little horn and the harlot and the abomination of desolation, etc. Now we need to bear in mind, and this is a very important point, that the Protestant reformers were no ignoramuses. Most of the great reformers, in fact all of the great reformers, had actually probably gotten doctorates in Roman Catholic institutions. They were very highly educated. Many of them were able to read Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. These were not individuals that were, you know, they, they just speculated, they were kind of dummies, you know, illiterate, so they didn't know what they were talking about. These individuals studied in Roman Catholic institutions. And not only that, they were highly educated in these institutions, so they knew what they were talking about. And as I mentioned, for them, the little horn of Daniel 7, the beast of Revelation 13, the heart of Revelation 17, the antichrist of 1 John 2, the man of sin of 2 Thessalonians 2, the abomination of desolation of Matthew 24, and the king of the north in Daniel 11, all represented the same system under different names. 
Now, what about the great confessions of faith of the churches? You know, the churches of the Reformation wrote these great confessions of faith, of what the ch their churches believed. And in these great confessions of faith, they clearly state that the papacy is the Antichrist. I'm going to read you now uh, from actually four confessions of faith of the Protestant churches that arose as a result of the Reformation. First of all, the Presbyterian Confession of Faith. Uh, it's actually known as the Westminster, Westminster Confession of Faith. This is what this confession says. There is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ. Nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but he is that Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition, that exalted, him, exalted himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God. That's the Presbyterian Confession of Faith. But these days the Presbyterian Church believes in what we call preterism. In our, in our next presentation, we're going to see what preter, preterism is. They basically say that the Antichrist, uh, you know, the little horn was Antiochus Epiphanes, and that uh, the beast of Revelation chapter 13 was probably Nero, because there was this tradition that uh, Nero was wounded to death, and then he recovered from his wound. Uh, actually, he died, and then he, re he reappeared again, and his wound was healed. So they said, Nero is the Antichrist. Let me read you from a homily of the Church of England, the Anglican Church. This is what it states. He, that is the Pope, therefore rather be called Antichrist and the successor of the scribes and Pharisees than Christ's vicar or St. Peter's successor. So what the Church of England is saying that the Pope, the Pope is the Antichrist and he's not the successor of Christ, he is actually the successor of the scribes and the Pharisees. Now what about the Lutheran Confession of Faith? This is in the Book of Concord, which uh, is a, a large book that contains many of the confessions and many of the teachings of the Lutheran Church. Now this is what the Lutheran Confession of Faith says. The Pope is the very Antichrist who exalted himself above and opposeth himself against Christ, because he will not permit Christians to be saved without his power, which nevertheless is nothing and is neither ordained nor commanded by God. Very clear. What about the Irish Articles of Religion, written in the year 1615? This is a rather lengthy statement, but once again, you're going to find that unanimously the Protestant reformers believed that the papacy was the Antichrist and the confessions of faith of the great churches agreed with the teachings of the reformers. This is what the Irish Articles of Religion had to say. Since the Bishop of Rome has erected a monarchy in Christendom, claiming for himself dominion over all churches and pastors, exalting himself to be called God, wishing to be adored, boasting to have all power in heaven and upon earth, to dispose of all ecclesiastical matters, to decide upon articles of faith, to authorize and interpret at his, as, at his pleasure the scriptures, to make a traffic of souls, to disregard vows and oaths, to appoint new divine services, and in respect to civil government, to trample underfoot the law, lawful authority of the magistrates by taking away, giving, and exchanging kingdoms, we believe and maintain that it is the very Antichrist and the son of perdition predicted in the word of God under the emblem of a harlot clothed in scarlet seated upon the seven hills of the great city which has dominion over the kings of the earth. And we expect that the Lord will consume it with the spirit of his mouth and finally destroy it with the brightness of his coming as he has promised and has already begun to do. I think that's pretty clear, isn't it? Crystal clear. The feeling was unanimous. 
And once again, folks, the way in which the Protestant reformers identified the papacy as the Antichrist was in two ways. Number one, by using the historical flow method, historicism. They could follow the links of the chain. They said, you know, the lion, clearly Babylon, the bear, clearly Medo-Persia, the leopard, clearly Greece, the dragon beast, clearly Rome, the ten horns, the divisions in Europe that had come from the Roman Empire. And they said, well, you know, that happened in the fourth and fifth centuries, and now, you know, the little horn must have risen. And so they looked over to Rome, they said, wow, the behavior of the, of the papacy is predicted very clearly in the prophecies of the little horn, the beast, the harlot, etc. You see, all they had to do was follow the tra trajectory of Bible prophecy and also look at the activities of the papacy to know that the papacy was the Antichrist of Scripture. Now, there were some things that the Protestant reformers did not understand. They didn't know about the deadly wound. As far as I know, they, they, they don't say much about the deadly wound, if at all. They didn't know that another beast, the United States of America, was going to rise from the earth. And that this nation was going to be different than any other nation before. It was going to separate church and state, and it was going to guarantee civil and religious liberty. The reformers didn't know that. That was still future. They didn't know that the United States would at first guarantee civil and religious liberty, but then later it would speak like a dragon by helping the first beast recover the sword or recover its power. Because all of this was still in the future. But they understood everything up to the point of the little horn because they were living during the period of the little horn. Now it's interesting to notice what Froome has to say in summary of all that the Protestant reformers and the Confessions of Faith said. I'm going to read now from his book, The Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, Volume 2, and pages 484 and 485. You see, the Protestant reformers made the Roman Catholic papacy tremble because the accusing finger was pointed at the papacy and their arguments were irrefutable because people could see that their interpretation of prophecy was correct and they could see that the description given of the Antichrist was fulfilled in the papacy. They could see it. And so what happened, the papacy actually not only lost thousands of members to the Protestant Reformation, the, the papacy also lost entire nations to the Protestant Reformation. Let me read you Froome's description of the aftermath of the views of the Protestant reformers. In Germany, Switzerland, France, Denmark, Sweden, England, and Scotland, there had been simultaneous and impressive declarations by voice and pen that the papacy was the specified antichrist of prophecy. All these nations. Germany, Switzerland, France, Denmark, Sweden, England, and Scotland. He continues writing, The symbols of Daniel, Paul, and John were applied with tremendous effect. Hundreds of books and tracts impressed their contention upon the consciousness of Europe. Indeed, it gained so great a hold upon the minds of men that Rome, in alarm, saw that she must successfully counteract this identification of the Antichrist with the papacy or lose the battle. And so the papacy said, we have to do something about the accusing finger of prophecy that's being pointed at us. We need to have that finger pointed in a different direction. And so we're going to notice in our next study that the Roman Catholic Church called a church council, the Church Council of Trent, the longest church council in the history of the Roman Catholic Church. And we're going to see in our study that the Roman Catholic Church and that council, which lasted from 1545 to 1563, 18 years, you know, 
Vatican II Council lasted from 1962 to 1965. That was three years. But this one lasted 18 years because the purpose of the council was to counteract the doctrines of Protestantism. Now, the Council of Trent did not actually deal with how to uh, deflect the finger of prophecy from the papacy. It just reaffirmed its doctrines and dug, it, dug it, its heels in doctrinally. But we're going to find that after the Council of Trent, two Roman Catholic scholars arose and they said, we know how to deflect the finger of Bible prophecy from the papacy to point it elsewhere. The first of these individuals, I'm going to pronounce the name as, it, you know, usually we say Alcazar, but we need to pronounce it properly. Luis de Alcazar. Actually, in Spain, it would be Luis de Alcazar. He invented, or actually he resurrected from the early church fathers, the um, what is known as preterism. The idea that the Antichrist prophecies were fulfilled in the distant past. And then another scholar arose, this is shortly after the Protestant Reformation in the Council of Trent, that disagreed with Alcazar, and he said, well, you know, Bible prophecy of the Antichrist has not yet been fulfilled. It is going to be fulfilled in the future. So basically, one scholar, Alcazar, says the Antichrist prophecies were fulfilled in the past, and Rivera says, no, the prophecies are going to be fulfilled in the future, the prophecies about the Antichrist. Now, if the Antichrist prophecies were fulfilled in the past, then they're not fulfilled in the papacy. And if they were going to be fulfilled in the future, they were not fulfilled in the papacy either. And so the purpose of these scholars was to deflect the accusing finger that identified the papacy as the Antichrist. These two individuals attempted to change God's prophetic calendar. They attempted to change God's prophetic times, if you please. Not only did the papacy think that it could change God's law, but it also tampered with God's prophetic calendar. It actually taught a different chain of events. Let me ask you, was the papacy doing something very similar to what King Nebuchadnezzar wanted to do? We studied this, right? We studied this in our second presentation. What did, uh, what did King Nebuchadnezzar do? Well, God said, listen, prophetic history is going to develop in this way. There's going to be a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a dragon beast. There's going to be a head of gold, breast and arms of silver, belly of bronze, legs of iron, and then ten toes. That's the way prophetic history is going to develop. And Nebuchadnezzar says, I don't like that scenario. So in chapter 3, what does Nebuchadnezzar do? He builds an image like the one that he saw in his dream, but it's totally of gold. What is he saying when he builds this image totally of gold? What is his objective? He's saying prophecy is not going to be fulfilled as God said. In other words, there's not going to be several kingdoms, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and then the divisions of Rome. No, 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 no. That's not the way that history is going to develop. Babylon is going to be an eternal kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Babylon's not only the head of gold, Babylon is the entire image of gold. And he said, woe to whoever has a different prophetic scenario than mine. And there was a small remnant of three that said, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not accept your perspective of prophecy. They're not, the issue is not only worship. The issue is also that Nebuchadnezzar is trying to counteract God's explanation of prophecy. So they say, we will not worship the image that represents the eternity of Babylon. We read from Ellen White last night. The indestructibility of Babylon. They said, we don't accept that scenario. So Nebuchadnezzar says, I will show you that my scenario is going to be true. I'm going to throw you in a furnace and then there will be no opposition. So he throws the three young men into the fiery furnace. He says, 
problem resolved. But what happened? Oh, we know the story. Jesus himself, the Son of God. By the way, he's called an angel in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 25. The person in the, in the furnace was the angel, Michael the archangel, if you please, which is a name that is given to Jesus Christ. The name means who is like God. And at the end, Michael is going to stand up to defend his people because the world, according to Revelation chapter 13, is going to say, who is like the beast? And Michael is going to say, who is like God? It's going to be a battle between the beast and Christ. And of course, Christ always wins that battle. So did you understand what we studied? Is this important? Ellen White has told us that if people don't know who the beast is, they will end up worshiping the beast. And so we need not only to understand this ourselves, we need to become loyal followers of Jesus like those three young men in the fiery furnace. We should love Jesus so much that it's more important than our own life. Only those who consider their link with Jesus more important than life itself will be able to remain firm in the final crisis. That's the kind of person that God wants us to be. He wants us to be like Daniel. You know, there's this, there's this song, Dare to be a Daniel, right? You know that you've heard that song before. You know, we need to be like Daniel, who said, you know, uh, my God, whom I serve, you know, he can deliver me from the, from the lions, but if he doesn't, I'll still serve the true God. Did Jesus come into the lion's den? It says the angel came into the lion's den. I believe that that angel is the same angel that delivered the three young men from the fiery furnace. So folks, in our next presentation, we are going to take a look at the Roman Catholic papacy's counter-reformation, their attempt to change God's prophetic calendar, and we're going to introduce how Protestantism imbibed the Roman Catholic methods of interpreting prophecy, and we can see the result today. Protestants have totally gone astray from their roots, and therefore they see no danger in Rome, they see danger for the, by, by the Muslims over in the Middle East. They say that's where the battle is going to be, they can't see where the battle is going to take place because they are looking in the wrong place. They have imbibed the prophetic methods of the Roman Catholic papacy. That's our next exciting study.